good morning. I, uh, I hope this is a good time after a break, right? We can get a sugar load and everybody's ready to go. Hey, uh, before I start, um, it's, it's interesting. I l- listened to the talks this morning. I saw some of the things that were said yesterday. And uh, this, this thought of uh, peripheral perception comes to mind. You know, we're all looking, we're sitting around a table and we're all looking at a flower arrangement, but depending where we see, we see different things. So Steve talked this morning about uh, you know, monolithic designs, seven nanometer, Moore's Law, these challenges. And it's interesting as a foundry, how we see things a little bit differently. And I hope when we get through this presentation today, we can understand in different perspectives where this industry is heading. But I'm going to ask you for a moment to uh, indulge me to do a little bit more of an introduction of who Global Foundry is to put some context uh, in this presentation. So let's see. There we go. Did that one come? Oh, I was one chart behind. There we go. Um, so based on revenue, we're the number one pure play foundry uh, in the industry. We're about $6 billion in revenue. Uh, since our inception in 2009, we ship about 2, bi- 2 million 300 millimeter wa- wafers equivalent out uh, last year, 15 million since we started. Broad range of customers and market segments that we serve. Uh, we have a broad range of technologies to be able to do that. Not only at the node platform level, we create features and make free- feature rich solutions around those, those technology nodes. We are a US DOD trusted foundry in two of our locations. A broad patent portfolio, Steve talked about IP and the importance of IP. And like we said, we, we play in a very broad set of uh, market segments. The thing about it is we're 16,000 employees strong worldwide between Singapore, US, uh, uh, and, and Europe, and then all our sales offices and, and design centers around the world. Um, I think something we're very proud of, and back to skills, is that we invest 1.6 million hours a year in training. And this is to create high-tech manufacturing jobs and skills where equipment technicians can you know, propel their career and grow their careers, maintaining these very sophisticated and highly automated fabs. And then, of course, you know, for us, you know, if you can't do safety, you can't do anything. And we're very proud of our uh, safety record as a manufacturing uh, facility around the world. OK, a little bit more about our footprint. Um, and you'll hear in, in a moment how the, the company grew. Let's start and we call the Tech Valley in the Northeast of the United States. We have Vermont uh, facility that came over to Global Foundries from our IBM acquisition. It's 200 millimeter. It's probably uh, the most sophisticated uh, facility in technology enablement, you know, leading edge in RF, so, uh, silicon germanium, and all connectivity type of uh, uh, technologies. We work our way south to Malta, New York, just north of Albany where we've invested over $12 billion in a leading edge technology facility that, that produces FinFET technology, 12 and 14 nanometer. A little bit further south to a facility in East Fishkill, New York, we call Fab 10. Uh, that was, came over again with the uh, IBM acquisition. That's a facility that for the next three and a half years, Global Foundries will run. And on December of 2022, on semi will then take that facility over for its next 50 year journey doing uh, power uh, uh, discrete devices. We work our way, let's see, that would be east to Germany, the largest single foundry with the la- la- latest 28 nanometer, 22 nanometer technology in all of Europe is our Dresden facility, Fab One. And then if we continue making our way around the world, we get to Singapore where we have something called Gigafab, which is a 200 millimeter at scale facility coupled in the same campus with Fab Seven, a 300 millimeter facility. So all told, we have uh, 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 six manufacturing sites around the world. So let's talk a little bit about Global Foundries, how we started. You know, because because the, the context around that is Global Foundries is a microcosm of the industry. It's always been about scale from where we all started. So in around 2009, AMD had to make a very important choice. What was the best version of themselves? Was it to be a product company? but to continue to develop technology and manufacture. And they decided the best version of themselves because of scale was to become a product company and spin out technology development and manufacturing. So they spun it out and we created a company called Global Foundries. Now just because you spin out something that doesn't have scale, the next day it doesn't have scale. And we began this journey to build a business that had a certain level of scale to have a sustainable business and economic model. Within a year and a half of that spin out, 
Global Foundries acquired the number two foundry at that time, Chartered Semiconductor, and that's how we came up with our Singapore footprint. Fast forward to 2015, Global Foundry inorganically makes another transaction, acquires IBM assets and the business of their microelectronics division and brings in that Burlington facility and an East Fishkill facility. And concurrently, in 2015, really begins in earnest to ramp that Fab 8 facility in Malta, New York, at leading edge technology at the time, 14 and 12 nanometer. A big organic investment. And so you fast forward to where we are today. We're a $6 billion company. We play broadly in the marketplace. And, uh, and uh, it took us essentially nine years, as a, this is our 10th year anniversary, to, to do things to get to the scale that can make us relevant in size and scope, and uh, to get to a point uh, where we now can make decisions about who we want to be as a business. So before we talk about who we want to be in this business, let's talk a little bit about the electronics ecosystem. Uh, my favorite chart is an inverted pyramid. And you see, we're talking about the semiconductor manufacturers, the foundries that feed all the fabulous companies. So you, you have five companies. It's a $63 billion market. It feeds the fabli, fabulous semiconductor providers, the Qualcomm's, the MediaTek's, the uh, NVIDIA's, the AMD's of the world, which is almost a $600 billion market that enables a $2 trillion electronics industry that, by the way, Without the electronics industry, there wouldn't be a world economy. So at this little tip of the pyramid, by the way, if the equipment guys were here, they'd say, hey, they're one further down. They're a $32 billion industry making equipment so manufacturers like Global Foundries can work. But I, 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 I purposely was, I took the author right here and didn't include them in the pyramid. Anyhow, I think what's very interesting in this chart is we could talk all we want about software, design, IP, but we need to manufacture this stuff. It needs to run on something. And this industry has it down to essentially five players left in the world manufacturing. Global Foundries, SMIC, TSMC, Samsung, UMC. Three of those companies are great at China, about to become less greater and more China. So it's very important we never take our eyes off of what we need to be doing from a manufacturing perspective in this industry. OK, a year ago, August, Global Foundries called the pivot. Uh, we were chasing leading edge technology, what we, what we, industry keeps calling Moore's Law. I will argue that I think we have a, a too narrow definition of Moore's Law, because Moore's Law is about innovation and creating value with successive generations of technology. We choose to define it as a smaller device and faster speed instead of other things we've done for a long time in this industry, embedding different function and creating the ability to make system on chip. In any case, our new business model was we could no longer afford, we didn't have the scale, even at $6 billion, to spend $3 billion a year in R&D and $10 billion in CapEx to enable enough scale and volume at leading edge. So we, we chose to have a, a business strategy that was consistent with our scale and the industry realities. We would have been number three, and the industry can barely have two at this, at this level of uh, technology and the limit of the marketplace. We redefine technology leadership and differentiation. I just spoke about it. It doesn't have to be smaller features and faster devices. It could be integration of, of, of feature-rich capability. And we participate more broadly in attractive markets as a result of this. So if we were looking at a chart like this 10 years ago, the leading edge at that time would represent 50 to 60% of the market. But as you see today, less than 12 nanometer, 10, 7, is only, it's $11 billion. It's still a sizable market, but only 20%. And yes, it does grow. It grows to 25%. As a company, we chose to focus in the blue area, in a larger part of the market. We were spending 85% of our R&D, 95% of our CapEx to chase you know, a third of the market that we actually participate in. And so we made the pivot. And we haven't looked back since then. And this is a little bit of my, uh, my view of the world of uh, Moore's Law. We, we all know the, the, the arrow coming down, successive nodes. We improve performance. We improve device size. We scale. But the fact of the matter is, as you can see in the, in the 
and TAM numbers, less and less applications fit the sweet spot of that. Typically, they're monolithic designs, a GPU, a CPU, a modem, you know, an APU. They're not a system on chip type of capability. And somewhere around 180, 130 nanometer, the industry started to say, hey, wait a second. Let's get a different level of integration. Let's start integrating more function and make a system on a chip. Now, Global Foundries has been doing that through its chartered facility, that we, you know, the Singapore facility we got from chartered for many generations. In fact, you know, there's a lot of applications today that go through uh, you know, very important uh, devices we make, and I'll talk a little bit about them later on, at 40 nanometer, at 55 nanometer uh, technology nodes. So anyhow, for us, we want to be platform innovators. We want to add features to specific market needs and enable a broad range of system on chip capability. So Moore's Law went from multiple chips, discrete function, connected and integrated at the printed circuit board level to take in those same building blocks and continue to add integration at the silicon level of different functions. And it always worked, it was always more affordable to integrate at the silicon level than at the packaging level, whereas first level package or second level. And I know this, I grew up in the industry as a packaging engineer when I started at IBM in 1989. You know, I was, uh, so excited to be part of the ball grid array innovation of the time. And, uh, and, and the fight there was always about uh, no sooner did you have a, you know, a great opportunity to put two chips in a multi-chip module, module, did someone come along with the next generation of technology, swept all that functionality into a single chip. Single chip will always beat packaging. But something's happening. Oh, did I not have that right chart up there before? I'm looking at the wrong monitor. Here we go. Um, Something's happening at leading edge in Moore's Law. Even the monolithic device in a CPU is better served, as Lisa Sue showed in her address, by breaking the function into the CPUs, the, the, the processor part, and then separating out the I.O. and the analog. Because I, uh, the, the analog and the I.O. just don't scale in these technology nodes. And it's more cost effective to integrate at the package level than at the die level. These are some of the realities of the complexity that's coming along with chasing Moore's Law. There's still ways around it. Great example of how to still leverage Moore's Law. It's still a relevant part of the industry. You heard Steve this morning. If you're not, if you're not doing monolithic designs on, uh, on the leading edge, you're not going to be in the business much longer. Here's a way to even leverage that further. Use leading edge where you need it and, and use packaging to bring in other parts of the functionality required. OK, I want to spend a little bit of time on this chart. It looks fancy, but it's really about the uh, virtual cycle of this industry and how technology, is uh, co-optimization, and the intensifying complexity is changing how we have to do business. Remember, we all started. We all started in this industry as part of an IDM. You had an end product, a system, you had chip designers, and you did manufacturing. And over time, as more as designs went from hundreds of thousands of transistors to millions of transistors to 10 million, to hundreds of millions to billions of transistors, the world got increasingly complex. And the business models, again, back to scale, started to collapse. So we all separated. Right? People became manufacturers. We created foundries. The fabulous industry, as Steve described this morning, was born. The system companies then would use the fabulous companies to do specific designs, differentiate in software and firmware, and then have those chips built at the foundries. Now, the beauty of the original IDM was that co-optimization took place in one company, maybe even one organization, from designing what the system architecture needed to be to what the chip designs had to be and making sure the technology was aligned to enable that. So as an industry, we swung the pendulum. We separated all that apart. The future now is what I call the, re, the virtual reintegration of the IDM model, where partnerships will have to be key. The complexity of these market segments and the features they need, where, you know, all designs needing at least a billion transistors. We need is a, uh, a partnership model between the system houses, 
the fabulous and the foundry to make sure we capture and get time to market advantage in this virtual cycle. So what are the key ingredients, at least from a DARPA perspective, and we happen to agree with, to be able to make this virtual cycle move? We're always going to need enhancement of materials and integration at the manufacturing level. If you want a new feature, you need to go to the periodic table and find a new element to integrate. Architectures, a lot of discussion about that this morning and designs. So, there we go. If you're DARPA, they have three pillars. And in those pillars, there are keys for success. And what we've done as a company in our partnership with DARPA is to make sure we're aligned with them. The first one is materials integration. And the key there is store memory. So under store, it's memory as a compute accelerator. How much did you hear this morning about the, the role of memory in computing? I know nothing about architecture. The only one thing I hear all the time is, it's not how fast you make the processor, it's how fast it has access to memory. So make sure you're doing the right memory technologies so that you can have the acceleration of compute. What's GF's response to that is we have MRAM that we're ramping in production now from, for 28 nanometer technologies and below. And we're going to be working on charge trap programmable secure. Today, our embedded flash is used universally in microcontrollers and automobiles to make sure air, air, airbags are deployed at the right time. If you do a, a mobile transaction on uh, Android or iOS phones, you're going through a chip that we make in 40 nanometer for a customer of ours in, uh, with uh, embedded flash. Second part is architecture. Compute. Local locality matters more than power processing. We have low power integration for data center AI. We believe, through our analysis, that the best architecture for AI of the future can't be serviced on, on any node less than 12 nanometer. And it's not, I know it might sound convenient because that's where we happen to end our technology. But the fact of the matter is, if the ideal architecture put memory next to processor, which we talked about in the left column, if you try to do it at too fine a pitch, then 12 nanometer, you become wire limited and you, you don't get the power performance. So the optimization point is a 12 nanometer, seven and a half pitch backend library to get the optimum architecture for AI of the future. And then lastly, on designs, the key for DARPA is learn. AI at the edge has to be adaptable for both hardware and software. Uh, Steve talked a lot about edge computing today. Uh, you know, this idea why well, you don't want everything to go to the cloud, yeah, there's a security dimension, but there's a financial dimension. You pay for bandwidth. You know, why, why do you need to have uh, your, your, your camera and image sensors taking place in the cloud and then coming back? Independent of security, that's a lot of bandwidth you need to spend. You can have that work done at the edge and only send up a small amount of that data and store in the cloud. For us, we developed SOI technology, we call it fully depleted FDX technology for low power connectivity. It has embedded RF performance that's outstanding in ultra low power for edge devices that by and large, you want to have them untethered. You know, one of the uh, applications Steve talked about today really excites me. Uh, and, and, and our technology, our 22 FDX is you know, winning sockets left and right. Is um, the Internet of Things started where everything was going to be connected, and it's going to, everything really needs to get connected and be intelligent. So what do I mean by really needs to get connected? Uh, by and large, if you bought a dishwasher or a refrigerator or a, uh, a washing machine, turns out maybe, maybe 60% of those devices, uh, the, the, the household who bought it would actually hook it up to their, their home Wi-Fi. For example, if you're my parents, uh, you didn't even know it had that feature. Right? So in the future, 5G is going to enable all these devices to have a, a, a connectivity that's baseband 5G. So when that, that white goods supplier sells that device and they go plug that washing machine in someone's home, it's automatically connected to the home base, to the manufacturer from market data, 
for maintenance, for diagnostics, to send, look at say, this, this, this machine has, a, has, a, has an issue. The world will only get more and more uh, connected through these different business models Steve talked about today, and that's a very exciting one for us, given how many uh, devices need to go from being smart to intelligent and connected on baseband and not just Wi-Fi. Okay, so what's the DARPA approach? That's how we align with DARPA. DARPA, is, it's, it's a great model, and it's kind of great work if you get it, if you have that type of horizon and long-term view. They understand future needs. They set ambitious goals. If the world is communicating at a gigabit today, they'll say, we want terabit. And they'll fund it on a pragmatic timeline. And I want to give you a couple examples of that. Now, when we were making this presentation, even though we didn't send it into yesterday and we're on probation for that, um, <laughs> we uh, were making these charts so they see and have uh, great outcomes. We were making these charts over the 4th of July weekend. And uh, so then we said, well, maybe should we have rockets or not? Maybe that's not the right thing. Well, anyhow, we're just going to stay with this format. So it's a springboard not only to serve national security interests, but it's a springboard to create the commercialization of technologies. So DARPA seeded a program called POEM, which was a silicon photonics program, seven years ago for $15 million. The direct outcome of that was a chip scale integrated photonic technology with embedded processors, so the combination of photonics with embedded processor. Critical connectivity component in US uh, supercube, uh, supercomputing. That's all we're allowed to know about it, and that's all we'll ever say about it, but a critical component. But here's the rub, what it did for GF. For GF, it created uh, something we call 45 RFSOI. RFSOI is instrumental to 5G millimeter wave deployment. Today, sub-6 5G, and everything older than that, the power amplifier in the front end module is always supplied by some type of gas technology. And then they integrate the LNA to low noise ampere, switches, tuner uh, 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 filters into a separate chip. In fact, in, in sub-6 5G, we have a technology called ATSW that's doing quite well in that space, thank you. But when you go to 27 gigahertz and higher for 5G millimeter wave, now the integration is one level higher. That power amplifier no longer needs to be in gas and can come right into our SIGI technology. And it won't be, I, I, we, we can't imagine either in the handset or in the infrastructure doing the broadcasting, right? any of those components being able to operate without a 45 RFSOI if it's doing 5G. On the other end, the silicon photonics part of that uh, program uh, is high speed uh, data center connectivity. So, you know, uh, blade to blade type of data center connectivity in practice today. In fact, one of our partner companies here, one of our fabulous uh, partners, uh, Air Labs, is here today as well. And uh, you know, jointly, we're addressing this market in a very exciting fashion. We see this as a huge opportunity for growth. So I, you know, look, if you ask GF, you know, we say the DARPA model works. It seeds early. It goes with a certain uh, topic that eventually becomes commercial, can be commercialized in a meaningful way. Uh, but at the same time provide uh, the national security interests earlier in these programs. So this has been our journey together with um, DARPA. We, start, we have completed programs. We just talked about that POEM program, which is silicon photonics, and how it's, it spawned our 45 RFSOI and some, and some data center connecti uh, connectivity. We have a CHIPS program on heterogeneous integration, uh, ACT on phased arrays, and ELAST on millimeter wave. So these programs are behind us, paid off in, in, in both the, the government use of this technology and even is important for GF in the commercialization of the technologies. We have a number of active programs with DARPA, you know, MIDAS and millimeter wave, reimagine, uh, re-image rather, and imaging, 
Shield and RF, craft and design. Uh, we have an SOC program. Franck is more about MRAM. We talk about the importance of MRAM. And then Posh and IDEA are on design. And we're looking forward to future programs on silicon photonics and RF and continuing this model and this partnership with uh, uh, DARPA. So look, for this to work, you know, we have a commitment to ourselves, our shareholders, the industry. We have become specialized in focus. We are going to be a major player in that 75% 70, of the foundry marketplace. We have an, a sustainable and attractive business model. What does that mean? We create value, we capture value so we can create more value, so we can invest in R&D. We're secure, we have two trusted fabs, and there's no reason that we can't expand that, that trusted fab footprint in the United States. And then we're able to leverage highly automated advanced U US manufacturing footprint. Those are the things that we would you know, argue for position GF uniquely in this industry. Now, uh, we have a, a saying at uh, uh, GF, it's kind of our vision. Uh, I see everybody in this, this room is close to my experience. experience. Um, and you just think about what it was like when you were growing up, when you were your kid's age, or your, and look how the world has changed. The world is completely different, how we engage with one another, how we engage with electronic devices, how we get our, our information. So I'm not going to argue that it's changed for the better. Everybody has a different opinion. I happen to think it did. But it doesn't matter. The industry that has changed the world is the semiconductor industry, and it will continue to do that. And in our partnership with DARPA, we want to change the industry that's changing the world together. So that's our story. We're sticking to it. We're very proud to be great partners with uh, DARPA, and we want to continue to, uh, to move the ball down the field together. Thank you.